and we are live how's it going everyone welcome back to the punch perfect boxing channel before we get going today make sure to like the episode and comment your thoughts down below and please subscribe to the channel so i'm going to be doing a bit of a, a welterweight episode today because there's been some news in the past couple of days and you know it's got me thinking about some possibilities for 2022 so you know i want to want to discuss some of them and welterweight still remains the kind of glamour division in boxing it's always been heavyweight, but away from the, the glory days of the heavyweights, welterweight has kind of been the, the weight class to be in ever since. So I'm going to talk about two bits of news that are kind of confirmed and the rest I'm just really going to speculate on and, you know, provide some options and, you know, create a bit of discussion that you guys can get involved with and let me know your thoughts. So the first bit of news is that the WBA have allowed um, Errol Spence and your Dinas Ugas to square off in probably March or April of this year on Fox pay-per-view. Um, this didn't look like the case originally. Ugas was denied the uh, the opportunity to take this fight. However, Stani Onus, who is the WBA mandatory, has agreed to step aside. And not only step aside, which I'm sure he would have been paid handsomely for, he's being put in with um, Buteyev, who beat Jamal James recently and was kind of going to be the, the third man involved in the scenario. I think that's a brilliant fight. Just wanted to mention that quickly. I think, you know, amongst all the big welterweight news, we're going to see two fringe contenders going in against each other with both with come forward, all action styles. I think that's a really, really good fight. And one that I think Buteyev can win as well. I think it's a really good matchup and one where if Stani Onus is in at his best, he could easily lose this fight. And I think we might find out a little bit about him here. So that's a really good fight. But now on to the main fight that we want to talk about. And, you know, Errol Spence, I've got to give my credit to him. And, you know, going into the comment section of this video, I'm not taking sides with any welterweight in this video. So do not jump in the comment section and start fanboying and say someone's ducking someone, someone's ducking whoever else. None of that. Let's just be objective and talk about what we know and the facts that are there. Errol Spence, you know, coming off such a, a bad eye injury and losing out on the biggest payday and the biggest opportunity of his career to date against Manny Pacquiao last year. Jordinus Ugas obviously jumped in, took that opportunity and really, you know, not changed his career so much, but he's obviously got a big payday off it. And, you know, people really consider him now to be at the top bracket of the division. I think before it was kind of Spence and Crawford and then there was like a bracket below, but I feel like people now put Ugas in that top bracket. Don't necessarily think he beats either of them, but they kind of have him up there because he's proven himself now and great performance, great win. And I actually think he's getting better. I think he's improved a lot, especially over the last couple of years. Should have had a win over Sean Porter as well. So yeah, he's a he's a genuine world level fighter. And um, going in against Errol Spence, who to his credit, you know, off the back of that injury is coming back and taking, you know, in the top three or four hardest fights possible at welterweight. That's really impressive. You know, alongside Ortiz, Boots and Crawford, Ugas is the is one of the toughest challengers out there. And I think it's a really interesting fight. You've got to give him credit for not taking any tune-ups, not delaying it, you know, just coming straight back into this fight. And I do think those signs of, of rust and injury will show early on in this fight. And I think if Ugas can get a rhythm going like he did against Pacquiao, I think he'll be a tough man to beat and this will be a tricky fight for Errol Spence. I do just feel Errol Spence is a little bit better. I feel like he, um, once he gets going and shakes off that rust, as we see with Errol Spence, I think around the halfway mark he'll start to really settle in. I've seen some people saying that, you know, he could stop Ugas. I do think that's a possibility, but I feel like it will be a really closely fought 12-round war, really. I don't think it'll be one of the fights of the years or one of the most dramatic or most thrilling fights, but I think it'll be a really gruelling fight for both men. One where early on, Ugas is having a lot of success and Spence is going to have to dig deep. And then once Spence gets on top, Ugas is going to have to dig deep and fight his way out of situations and not just try and box. I think it's a really interesting fight. You know, outside of the, the Crawford fight, I think this is probably, you know, right up there as one of the fights we want to see in the division. Three belt unification, a big, big opportunity for the winner to move closer to Undisputed and, you know, kind of hold their claim as the number one welterweight with having three of the belts. So it's a really interesting fight that should land in March of eight or April next year on Fox Pay-Per-View. It's really interesting. I want to hear your thoughts down below, guys, on how you see that fight going. Like I say, I lean towards Errol Spence, but I think it's going to be a lot closer than some people think. And I think it's going to be a, a hard 12-round fight. The other fight that has been mentioned... 
um, and has been agreed by kind of both promotional teams and the WBO have approved it as a final eliminator is Virgil Ortiz Jr. versus Michael McKinson. So that's an interesting, you know, kind of situation really. We know that Ortiz was highly ranked with the WBC and he was offered the Avenesian fight and didn't take it and has instead gone down the WBO route, which just in terms of champions means he fancies the Crawford fight you know, in the in the late part of next year or 2023. Um, so he's going down that route and he gets matched against the number three contender, Michael McKinson. Now, my thoughts on this fight is, I've seen on social media a lot of people say, you know, McKinson's really tricky. He's got great feet, great defense. And I get all that. I think he has got great feet. I don't think he's got great defense. I think he's got awkward. You think he's awkward, but I don't think he's necessarily great defensively. Um, but he is tricky. However, some people are sort of saying it's almost as if Virgil Ortiz is going to have to show us something different in this fight. He's going to have to prove himself against a tricky opponent and all these things. Last time I checked, Virgil Ortiz has been knocking on the door of world level by fighting the likes of Mean Machine and Maurice Hooker. Whereas Michael McKinson's best win is Chris Congo. Um, his last fight against Ranowski wasn't particularly impressive either. So McKinson's the one taking the jump up here and as tricky as and awkward as he is and he will try and be as tricky and awkward as can be for Virgil Ortiz. This isn't a jump up for Ortiz. This is a different style and it might be a tricky style for a part of the fight. But I don't really understand the notion that this is going to be particularly tough for Ortiz. Michael McKinson has no power whatsoever and as we've seen with Maurice Hooker, you can outbox Ortiz all you like if you haven't got the power to make it count, he's just at some point going to decide that he can walk through you. And I think that's the difference here. I think for all the all the breakdowns we can do, all the discussions we can have, if Virgil Ortiz at any point in this fight decides, I'm just going to walk through Michael McKinson, he's absolutely going to be able to do that. He's not going to be met with much resistance other than awkwardness. McKinson's going to try and make it as 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 rough and, and as as tricky as possible and it's going to be a scrappy fight and messy fight but with Ortiz's power with his physicality with his strength if he decides at any point I am just going to set about McKinson I'm done playing games I'm going to walk through him like he did against Hooker I think he can absolutely do that so whilst I feel like McKinson will be will be fine early on I feel like he gets blown out of the water here and I'm not sure it's as competitive as some people make out and I'm not sure it's even the right fight for McKinson, to be honest. If this was Conor Ben that was, you know, ranked third with the WBO, Hearn would have been making this fight because he's got bright, you know, a bright future planned for Conor Ben, and he sees, you know, a lot of good things coming for him. He signed Michael McKinson off the back of the Chris Congo performance, which was a really good win, but then felt like the Ranowski fight. He stunk it at, stunk the place out, and he's not particularly enjoyable to watch either McKinson. And it felt like Hearn sort of thought, well, he's not going to be, the, you know, he's not going to be a superstar because he's not entertaining enough in a division that's full of much bigger stars and much more entertaining fighters. This opportunity's come around, I'm just going to throw him in there. And I feel like he wouldn't have done that with someone that he had bigger plans for. And I feel like maybe he's going to say that this is a great opportunity for McKinson and whatever. But I don't think there's much upside for McKinson, as some people make out. I like McKinson. I think he's an awkward fighter. I actually think against the likes of Conor Ben, he could be you know, come out on top or even be really awkward and horrible for those type of styles. But Virgil Ortiz is, is much better than that. He's he's much more physical than than, the, than that sort of level that McKinson's been at before. He punches a lot harder. He's improving in that Cavaliauskas fight when he went behind the jab after being hurt and having the knockdown in the third round. He's very methodical about his work. And although he still gets a hit a little bit too much for my liking, he won't pay for it against McKinson. So yeah, I'm not quite convinced it's the fight that some people are making out. So those are the two fights that we've seen. That was rumoured to land in January, but we've seen quite a few announcements taking place now. So I'd imagine either end of Jan, early Feb is probably when we're looking at that fight to happen. And now I want to talk about the two other guys in the division that are my two favourite welterweights, um, Jaron Boots Ennis and Terence Crawford. Where does that leave these two? I look at Jaron Ennis and I'm not really sure and some people are saying they should just fight each other. Listen, I think Showtime um, and Boots Ennis's management probably believe, although he they believe, because uh, I've seen interviews and I've you know, heard them speak, they believe he can beat anyone in the division. But they know that that's probably not the right time to make this fight. You need to... 
you need to be smarter with a young fighter and their trajectory. And I'm not talking about in terms of, you know, if fight fans, we want to see that fight. I get that and I want to see that fight. But I just think in terms of a career and how you manage your career, that's probably not what Showtime do. I don't think they'd risk one of their young stars losing to someone like Crawford. So I think for Jaron Ennis, it's going to be an interesting year. The IBF, who he's, I think he's the highest ranked with the IBF. He is highly ranked with the WBO as well. He's two with the WBO. But because of Ortiz and McKinson being ordered, he's kind of become redundant in that situation. So I'll ignore that. He's highly ranked with the WBC. And they did mention that he could fight David Avenetian. I'd love that fight. That's a credible win. That would be a really good win. One that I think he wins comfortably as well. I think that's a good fight if he goes down the WBC route. And I would like to see him put, really knock on the door and get on the heels of Errol Spence and try and force that fight through. So I think the WBC route would be good. However, the IBF has really opened up. And that is because Abdukakarov, who was the number one and was going to get his mandatory shot in 2022, lost to Cody Crowley uh, the other week. I actually said that I thought that, that he was going to lose. And Cody Crowley isn't ranked in the top 15 with the IBF. So although he will get a good ranking, he won't assume the number one position and go above the likes of, of Boots, etc. So that's an interesting situation because the number one has basically now become free and open and available. And that number one would be Jaron Ennis. And then you look down the rankings and see who he could fight in final eliminators or potential opponents. The name below him is Virgil Ortiz, but we know what's going on there. The next name after that's Connor Ben. I don't see Eddie Hearn taking that risk. We know what they're like. You then got Ivan uh, Gulov of uh, Ukraine. That's not a fight I particularly want to see. And then number seven is David Avenetian again. So maybe we get Jaron Ennis versus David Avenetian in 2022. I think that's best case scenario. I think names like Castillo Clayton will it be explored as well because he's highly ranked with the IBF and has bocked on Showtime and it's becoming a bit more of a name, so I think he will be in and around that mix as well. But I think they should be looking at a David Avenetian fight. I think Neil Marsh, who manages Avenetian, isn't telling us the full story about some of these fights and is acting like Avenetian's being avoided. But he's not a name at all. And to Eddie's credit, although we want to see Conor Ben versus Avenetian, he does have a point when he says that there are lesser names that can do more for his career. And that's a shame because as fight fans, we shouldn't care about that. But from a business sense, and that's all Eddie and most promoters care about, you know, it's not always the, the best case for us fight fans. So I think the David Avenetian fight, the IBF might order it, the WBC might order it. They need to have a look at that and see if we can get that fight because I think that's the, the best possible name that is realistic for Jaron Ennis. So I hope we see that. Um, the next person to talk about, who am I forgetting? Uh, Terence Crawford, obviously, for me, the, the number one welterweight in the world at the minute. I think he's still in a bit of a bad place, really, because I don't, I don't really know what's available. I do understand that if Spence versus Ugas, you know, does happen and then we get a winner, you know, that the, we will then be in a position where two guys can face for undisputed and that will just be... You know, but there's no ignoring that. The pressure will be piled on. But Spence will have a long line of mandatories that he'll have to deal with. And although Undisputed usually trump mandatories, it is going on a little bit now. So, you know, and if, if Jaron Ennis is in a mandatory position at that stage, he'll be saying, what about me? I want my opportunity. Um, so it will be interesting to see whether that can unfold. I think Virgil Ortiz will be knocking on the door of a mandatory for Crawford by the end of the year as well. I just look at Crawford and think the three agency thing is great now, but who does he necessarily fight? I think the names that are viable, if Keith Thurman gets a win over Mario Barrios in January when that fight is you know, being tipped for, I do think that that becomes possible just because Thurman is a name, he's a former champion. And if he looks good, I think there'll be enough interest in it. I still think a lot of people will pick Crawford, but that's not a bad fight for PBC to to say to Crawford, look, loads of money, come fight on our platform, you get a big name like Thurman, and let's make, let's make this happen, we can go from there, and you can get the undisputed winner. So, you know, that, yeah, the unified uh, winner between Ugas and Spence. So, there's that sort of possibility that I see being feasible, but then I think they probably need to look at people that are free agents and potential names that they could get up there. One name that stands out for me is Regis Progre. Again, I don't think he'll be the best at welterweight. I don't think he'll beat a Crawford, but it'll be a competitive fight and a credible opponent that they can look at. So yeah, I'm not really sure what, what comes for Crawford, but it'll be interesting. And I hope he doesn't just wait around for an opportunity. I hope he stays busy. 
if Furman fights in January, why not try and get that fight you know, scheduled for the kind of middle part of the year and then later in the year they look at the, the Spence fight finally and try and get a deal done for that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the route I see him going down. And I did just mention there, Thurman versus Barrios. I didn't plan to talk about that, but it just pops into my head. Um, I can't believe that's on pay-per-view. It's not a pay-per-view fight by any means. Um, however, I think it's an okay fight. I think with Thurman being out the ring for so long, anyone that has boxed near world level is a good enough opponent, really, considering how long he's been out. Um, but I don't really rate Mario Barrios. I didn't rate him before he fought Tank. I don't rate him after he fought Tank. And I don't particularly see what he's going to do at 147 either. But I think he's a credible enough opponent for Thurman to come back to. And if Thurman... You know, the Pacquiao defeat gets kind of overstated a little bit. In the second half of the fight, he actually came back and looked quite good. But he has slowed down over the years with injuries and now with a lot of inactivity. But I do still fancy him to win that fight. So I've been talking for about 16 minutes now. Let me know your thoughts down below, guys, on Spence Ugas, Ortiz versus McKinson, Thurman versus Barrios. And then let me know what you see being feasible for Boots Ennis and also Terence Crawford. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. More videos coming. I'll catch you next time.